Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace as we continue this series. We pray for fresh anointing of Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Think like Jesus. We started this series some time ago. We've done part one in thinking like Jesus. Part one was an introduction that took us into two sessions, part one A and B. So we have part one A, think like Jesus, part one B, think like Jesus. Then we went to part two, think like Jesus, which is maintain an altar. Make sure you are in constant communion with God through prayer. Every Christian, you must have a personal altar. And then we went to part three, the kenosis of Christ. The kenosis of Christ means the humility of Christ. Christ pouring himself out, made himself of no reputation. As a Christian, you must be humble before God and before all men. Genuine humility, not pretentious humility, in which a man pretends to be humble on the outside, but inside his heart is lifted up. That is pretentious humility. As a matter of fact, that is the worst form of pride. Pretentious humility is the worst form of pride. When a man who is haughty and arrogant on the inside pretends to be humble on the outside. Then we did part four. How to handle offenses. We mentioned in part four that there is nothing you can do. Offenses will come. So long as you are in this world, offenses will come. Luke chapter 17, verse 1 makes it clear. Offenses will come. It is impossible for you to avoid it. How do you handle it? In doing that teaching, we try to explain that there is a difference between offenses coming to you as an individual and people doing evil against the work of the kingdom of God or people doing evil in the land. As a Christian, you are meant to resist evil. As a Christian, you are meant to contend for the faith. So when you see someone who is misconducting himself in the church, either telling lies or stealing money or committing adultery or being arrogant or, or haughty or being lawless, God expects you to resist him. That's why he says contend for the faith. That's why Jesus entered the temple. And showed us a practical example. What you should do. He entered the temple with sticks. With whips. And he flogged people out. Overthrew their table. And told them to get out. Don't turn the, my father's house into a den of robbers. It is a house of prayers. So let us be careful. So we do not swing from one extreme to another extreme. In which we now accommodate Anything that is done. No, you are not supposed to. You must know when you are supposed to react. And you must know when you are supposed to be quiet. And submit yourself, submit yourself to God. When it comes to offenses that is personal to you. We explain in that teaching. It is also on this channel. As a reminder. We are doing a teaching on Think Like Jesus. Because if a man does not think like Jesus, he cannot speak like Jesus. He cannot act like Jesus. He cannot live like Jesus. He cannot be like Jesus. It all starts from the way that you think. So, once you think like Jesus, you will live like him. You will speak like him. You will behave like him. Anyone who does not speak like Jesus, does not think like Jesus, does not act like Jesus, is not a Christian. Because Christianity means you are Christ-like. Anyone who has met you should have met Christ. 
Whatever you say is what Christ is supposed to say. That's why the Bible says that if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. But it all starts with the way that you think. So, train yourself to begin to think like Jesus Christ, your master. That is when you become a true disciple. In this particular teaching, it is titled, Endure Suffering. Think like Jesus. Let your mind begin to work. Endure Suffering. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. There is a mind that was in Christ Jesus. That mind should be in you. You should think like Christ. And Christ made up his mind that for him to do the will of God, he is going to suffer. And Christ was prepared. Christ was ready to endure suffering. In John chapter 15, verse 20, the master says, Remember the word that I said to you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. If they have persecuted him, they will persecute you. Which means, if Christ has suffered, you are also going to suffer. It is not punishment. It is not a curse. It is part of the Christian life. And we will explain why. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Verse 1. These things have I spoken to you. That you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. We are going to see more of these Bible passages. But let us look at First Peter chapter 2. And read something there. You will remember in one of our previous teachings we mentioned that it is only on two occasions that the Bible records that Christ left us examples. In which it, the Bible says categorically, Christ left us examples. And what are the examples? The first example is in John chapter, 15, chapter 13 verse 15. John chapter 13 verse 15 in which the master says ye call me lord and master and ye say right well if I your lord and your master have washed your feet ye also ought to wash one another's feet seeing I have left you an example that ye should do as I have done. The first example that Christ left for us is the example of humility and servanthood. Humility and servanthood. The second example has to do with what we are teaching now. And it is in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now listen to the first statement. For even here unto were you called. Even here unto you were called to come and endure suffering. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 
This point needs to be made clear because there is a gospel that is going on now. The social gospel that tells you, come to Christ, all your sufferings are over. Come to Christ and you will have better life. Come to Christ and you will prosper. Come to Christ and you will get employment. Give your life to Jesus so you can get the fruit of the womb. Give your life to Jesus so that your family, your marriage can prosper and everything. Can be. That message is going on now. And a lot of people are flocking into the church following those fake and false promises. So the moment after conversion, wham, God hits them. And begins to break down all those walls of error. So that they can be conformed to the image of Christ. And the fellow who heard that when he comes to Christ, everything is going to be rosy. Suddenly discovers that on account of his newfound faith, he's losing his friends. He's losing his associates. He's losing contracts. He's losing people that are, uh, some of them say, ah, this is not what they told us now. And at that point, many people have gone back. What the unfortunate thing is that many others refuse to go. It would have been better if those who discovered that living the Christian life is not good for them. It is good that if they said they will go back, it's better. They have the opportunity of coming back afresh. But some just stay inside the church. They stay. And spiritually, they stagnate. They only observe the rhythms and the motions of Christianity. But the life of God is not there. That is why we have millions of people inside the church. And there are very few Christians in the world. Very few Christians in the world. So we need to explain so that you can understand why God permits his children to go through suffering. And why God has programmed that your Christian life is going to face some challenges and some turbulence. Number one, to teach Christians obedience. Why does God permit us to go through suffering, the first reason is to teach us obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Though Christ was a son, he learned obedience. Jesus did not bring obedience from heaven. He was obedient to the death on the cross. He did not bring it from heaven. He learned the obedience here by the things which he suffered. And he went through a lot. If he had to trek everywhere to go and do the will of God, if he had no house, no home, nothing of his own, he was depending only on people supporting his ministry. Then that was a lot of stress because he was not allowed to do any work the moment the ministry started. He had to learn obedience. And that same call is what he now extended to each one of us following him. That is why in John chapter 15 verse 20, he said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. A servant is not greater than his master. And that is why he says in John chapter 16, sorry, yes, John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. In the world, you shall have tribulation. God has to take us through fire to teach us obedience. Because many of us are just stubborn. We grew up with a stubborn attitude. Self-will. It is what we want that matters. And because some of us have been able to get what we want as a result of our stubbornness in the world, we believe that even with God, stubbornness will carry you somewhere. So God says, turn right. You say you are going straight. And then there is a conflict. God says, no, I want you to turn right. God tells you, stop talking. And you say, no, why won't I talk? I will say my own. Self-will. For our will to be submitted, to be yielded to the will of God, then God has to deal with you. When you see a Christian who is meek, who is gentle, <laughs> if that guy is not pretending and is genuinely meek and gentle, tell him to share with you what he went through under the hand of the Holy Ghost. Tell him. You will be shocked. In fact, you will be afraid to be a Christian. Therefore, God has to beat us hard to make us to conform to his will. Not that he's forcing our will, but he will make sure that he will not allow you to have your way. Many of us have our plans ready, what we want to do with the gospel. Many of us came to Christ with preconceived idea of what we want God to do for us. Many people came not ready to do the will of God, but they want God to do their will. So there will be a clash between them and God. So suffering starts. If your mind is not made up that as a Christian you are going to suffer, then there is every possibility you are going to backslide. Or you are a Christian, you are stagnating inside the church. Number two, to know what is in your heart. We see an example of this from the way God dealt with the Old Testament saints. We just see an example of what God did and the way God treats his children. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, all the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna which you knew not, neither did your fathers others know that he might make you know that man doth not live by bread only but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That was how he dealt with the Old Testament saints so that he would know what was in their heart and in a similar manner God is dealing with many New Testament saints. It is easy to say I love Jesus when everything is going smoothly. But when you go through a serious stress, if you know what I'm talking about, open your mouth and sing praises. Open your mouth and say, I love Jesus. When things are, when the fire is really burning, at that moment, God is seeing what is in your heart. Many people have proven that they are just pretending when they say they love Jesus. They don't love him one bit. They are only happy for what they are getting from him. When it comes to make sacrifices for Christ, they are not willing to. So that is why you must learn to endure suffering. Because whatever suffering that comes to your way, it is God approved. From the moment you give your life to Jesus, the suffering, it is God approved. Number three, to teach you patience. To teach you patience. Oh, I did mention that we, are, we have to do a teaching on the way of God. How God operates. Many Christians don't know how God operates. 
They assume that the way man operates is the way God also operates on the earth. But it is not so. The operations of God are totally different from the way man handles situations. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. James chapter 1. Now listen to this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now who is going to do that? Diverse temptations, diverse trials. Count it all joy. You get to the office, they say that they've sacked you. You get to, into your vehicle to drive home, the engine knocks. You get, you manage to take it to a mechanic and then you are still looking for money to repair it. You get to the house, something else has happened. And in that situation, somebody quotes to you, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What will you do to that fellow? But the Bible explains in verse 3, say, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. That the reason why God is testing your faith is because he is teaching you patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Say so don't rush to get out of that stress. Say so let patience deal with you very well. So that you will learn how to be patient and submissive when things are not working well. That was what Christ too went through. And today, he is the most glorious in the entire universe. That is the kind, the same glory that God wants for you. If you are going to get it, you have to take the road that Christ took. There is no other way. That's why Christ says he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. If you want to be like Christ, you must go through the way. That Jesus went. There is no other way. There is no other way. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Yep. Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Ah, ah, this. We glory in tribulation. Ah, we rejoice in tribulation. We exult in tribulation. How many Christians do that? The moment one tribulation comes, you see Christians begin to panic. They are looking for deliverance ministers. They are looking for pastors to pray. They are beginning to call brethren, pray for us, intercede on our behalf. People pray. They are calling for uh, fasting and prayers. They are calling for prayer meetings. But the Bible says we glory in tribulation. We rejoice in tribulation. We exult in tribulation. Just like somebody saying, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And God is saying the same thing. That look, don't look at difficulties in your life as something negative. Look at it as God working in you and working through you to bring you to perfection. That's what God is saying in his word. Don't see it as being negative. Begin to change your attitude towards problems and tribulations as a Christian. Because you know one thing. Nothing can happen to you without God your father approving it. And whatever God approves to come to you, it is for your good. That's why the Bible says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of them that love him, who are the called according to his purpose. So whether it is life, whether it is death, so long as it is from God, it is good. So, Romans chapter 5, 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. 
also knowing that tribulation works patience the same thing we saw in james chapter one patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope makes not ashamed because the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts by the holy spirit which is given to us to teach you patience number three why do we endure suffering to show you are a partaker of christ's suffering first peter chapter four first peter chapter four we start from verse 12. First Peter chapter 4. We start from verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But you rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now that is why you go through it. Because you are meant to be a partaker of Christ's suffering. Verse 16 says, Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this behalf. If any man is a Christian, suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. It is a faithful saying, verse 11, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. So if you are going to reign with him, you must be prepared to suffer with him. If you are going to reign with Christ, you must be prepared to suffer with him. Christ. You can note First Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 7. Please note First Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 7. Number 5. Why do we have to endure suffering? Because God has to discipline us as sons. He has to discipline us as sons. You find that in Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 5 to 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 12. Uh, sorry, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves is chastened, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Now verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And lift up the feeble knees. The knees that will not be able to kneel down to pray. Lift it and begin to pray. Even in that situation where you are in. Because it is God who is taking you through discipline. So, how should a Christian handle hardship? You handle it with praises. You handle it in thanksgiving. You handle it with faith in God. James chapter 1 verse 2 already told you, count it all joy. Count it all joy. When you go through diverse temptations. One of the easiest ways to come out of suffering and out of affliction as a Christian is to begin to turn it into praises. Almighty God, I thank you for what you are taking me through. I thank you, Almighty God, for nothing happens to me without your knowledge. I know I may not understand it now, 
but it is for my good. I will understand later. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Whatever you are going through right now, no matter how tough, how painful it is, as a Christian, God says it is working for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Endure! Christian endure suffering. Things went wrong for your master while he was on the earth. Things will definitely go wrong for you, but it does not mean God has forsaken you. It is working for you eternal weight of glory. It is a temporary affliction. It's a light affliction. As far as God is concerned, it is a light affliction. But what it will produce for you is an exceeding weight of glory in all of eternity. So the choice is yours. Like we just shared, the easiest way to handle pains is to say, Only Father, I thank you for this one. I don't understand why you have permitted it. Yes, I agree it is very painful. It is hurting me so bad. But because I trust in you, my Father in heaven, I thank you for everything I'm going through. Whether I like it or not, whether I understand it or not, Almighty God, I thank you. Be thou glorified. That is the spirit of Christ.